All right. How's everybody doing? How are you doing this balmy January day? It's amazing. Amazing. More, Lord. Let's just pray that for a minute. More, Lord. Hey, real quick, report on our uh, finances last week. I, I, I threw up a little distress flag saying uh, we need prayer right now. Financially, we're, uh, it's complicated, but it's a cash flow thing, and we just really need the Lord to move. We're going to pray for our finances here in just a minute, corporately and individually. Let me tell you a little story, though. Periodically in my life, God gives me these little parables that I walk through. I, don't, I, don't, I have no idea typically that I'm in the middle of a word of the Lord. This could be verified out of Psalms. Uh, Joseph basically walked through a parable. Uh, all of Israel walked through a parable basically to be an example for each one of us. Yesterday was such a beautiful day. I, I felt inspired to get on my motorcycle, so I did, and uh, went out for an hour and a half. It was beautiful through the Metro Park. And uh, I, uh, I got up this way and I realized I'm gonna go over and visit. I've got a relative that lives up here. I'm going to go over and visit, and so I made a quick call, stopped the bike first, made a quick call, and uh, I said, hey, you home? I want to pop by. Is it okay? Blah, blah. Yeah, sure. I go over there, get off my bike, go in. We have a, uh, some uh, glass of water or something like that together, and uh, I didn't stay long, just chatted, got updated, you know, I was just out for the beautiful day, and, and uh, she has, has a dog, and so I was walking out of the house, and I said, does your dog bite? Now, those of you who have watched TV for a number of years, you know that's the wrong thing to ask because then the dog bites you and the person says, that's not my dog. But anyway, uh, I said, did your dog bite? She said, no, only when people are in the house. So I quickly stepped out of the house, but the dog must have uh, sight problems uh, because immediately the dog came up and bit me. And uh, I was a little stunned by it because I believe that this dog did not bite, you know. So I got bit, and uh, but it didn't it didn't reach the skin. Just uh, wounded my jeans. <laughs> they're home recovering right now. Should have brought them in to pray for, but they're home reco It's home recovering, and it kind of shocked me a little bit. But I was on my way out, and I thought, well, it's time to go. And I got got on my motorcycle, put my uh, helmet on, and everything, and and off I went. But as I was getting on the motorcycle, I forgot the name of her dog, and I heard her reprimanding her dog. Her dog's name is Cash. And I thought, that's a bizarre name for a dog. I said, Cash? And she said, yeah, the people I got it from found him at a bank. And so I just named him Cash. So Cash bit me yesterday. Are you starting to get it? <laughs> but did not break the flesh, <laughs> the skin. I quickly moved on, got on my Triumph motorcycle, put on my helmet and my body armor, and took off. And, and as I took off, I just started kind of laughing. I mean, you know, usually when you get bit by a dog, that's not the first the emotion that comes. But, but I just thought, Lord, is, is this a picture here that, that we're getting a little bit bit by cash right now? But... But Lord, it's okay. It's just a surface wound to my jeans, and that's it. And I'm gonna get on my triumph, and everything's gonna be okay. And I, you know, I mean, I didn't hear a voice from heaven. There was no angels, no choir singing, or anything like that. But I just had a sense, like, Lord, this is this too shall pass. Last week I talked about bare metal, and that some of the paint had come off, and we can see some bare metal. And uh, it's it's the tightest scenario we've been in, I believe probably since our first year being here. And so I'm appealing to you. I want to pray corporately. Now, I, I, you need to give too. I'm, uh, if you're online, last week we had over 800 people that have watched the uh, message from last week. We've got another congregation out there of people that, that are receiving from this teaching out of this house and worship and so forth. And if you're online and you feel inspired or impressed to help us out, go to BethelCleveland.com. But the rest of you, I'd like you to stand up if you could. We're going to pray corporately again for our finances. We may do this every week until we're well on the other side of this. Last week, there was a good response. We got a little bit more paint on the metal, which helped out. We had a, an offering that bumped up and really helped us out. But this week, we also got an out-of-contract expense of $15,000. So we were 
There was a wrestling match this week as we're, as we're moving ahead. And obviously, when you look around, we've got a great church of givers. There's a good congregation here. We've got a lot of people that are involved in Bethel Cleveland. But we're just in one of those narrow passages that we need to pray ourselves through. So let's do that right now. In fact, if you could touch the person next to you graciously, maybe on a shoulder, hold their hand, whatever you feel appropriate. If you're related to them, you might hold the hand. If not, touch the shoulder. We agree together right now, Lord, corporately solutions. Well, we just declared this thing over our, our own finances, this de decree. We declare over this church, Lord, it'll be the head and not the tail. It'll be above and not beneath. And Lord, your blessing and your favor has come upon it financially. We pray, Lord, for more than enough. I don't want to just get by. I want abundance. You know what happens when you get abundance? You have a bun dance. Abundance. It is exciting. It is powerful. Lord, I pray that next week there will be a testimony of extraordinary outpour from heaven into this situation, into this congregation, corporately in our church. Now, individually, anyone struggling with lack of any sort, lack, loss, or limitation, I declare right now Jehovah Jireh, the God who is abundantly our provider and more than enough would come into this situation. I ask Lord that 26 17 will be a gusher of financial provision at all levels in Jesus' name. For those that are in this room, those who couldn't come today and those that are online, we bless you right now and I speak to you to give in faith into this need and let's see the abundance of God come forth in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. You don't want to talk about reflection today, reflecting what's in heaven on earth. And this is a bit confusing because I actually got two messages this week and, and they're, they're not dissimilar. They're just nuanced differences. So I'm going to be jumping back and forth between the two. And I hope it all makes sense within the next 27 minutes uh, as, we, as we look ahead. But we're going to go to scripture. We've been in Hebrews. I started last week with uh, following Jesus, part one. And last week was about action. We talked about the faith literally is kinetic. Now, I know that we have our faith, which is our belief in God. That's, that's a, a, a living, active thing within us. But that faith is meant to be exercised. We, this is not, um, Christianity is not specifically and only a cognitive religion. I mean, there is an understanding that comes into the mind, but the mind is not the main driver. It is not a, uh, just a, an emotive religion. You know, we don't have to cry each week hoping that God will hear us. Once you're in the kingdom, you're in the kingdom, and you're a son, and God's your father, and, and uh, uh, amazing things happen. It's this great father-son relationship. You know, it's God and sons, God and daughters. This is great business that God started a while back. He's got a big van up in heaven. Your name's on the side of it. God and you working together. This partnership between your heavenly father, what Jesus has called in Isaiah, the eternal father. He cares for you. He loves you. He has a destiny for you. He has dreams for you that out, outperform your dreams. Make the great exchange of heaven. Give your life away. Take his. Amen. Way better deal. <laughs> walk in his dreams. Quit talking about your dreams. Say, this is God's dream for me. I'm walking in God's dream. Amen. The provision, the love, and the mercy of God, you know. So, we want to follow in that. We want to follow. By faith, though, it's action that when you move in faith, and I touched on this briefly toward the end of last uh, Sunday. When you move in faith, there is something about faith that God really likes. In fact, it says in Hebrews that without faith, without this continual action of leaning forward into the progressive understanding of who God is and what he wants to do, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, does that mean God's not happy? You know, no, no, no. There's something, he's a father. There's something like if you're a father or you're a mother, you get when you see your children do what you hoped they would do, right choices, that warm feeling that you get is what God feels when you move in faith. When you move in faith, it's not a motive necessarily. It's not cognitive. It is kinetic though. You do something here and Jesus said his dream was to have a church that did this. His dream was, in, in Matthew, he talks about it, you know, uh, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
And then he said, I will give them the keys to the kingdom, and this is it. And there's an action that comes, and what they bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What they loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, this sounds a little bit weird, and some of you, it might shake your theology a little bit. Salvation is just pure faith in God. You confess and receive, and salvation comes unto you. I believe that. You are not born into Christianity. You are born again into Christianity. If you believe you're born into Christianity, that's universalism. But you are born again. There comes a time in your life. You must make a decision. I choose Jesus Christ. And when you choose Jesus Christ, all of who he is and all of what he has come to you and is available to you. It's called in the New Testament, the riches of God in Christ Jesus. And so you begin to access. You learn over your life. It's part of faith that when I move, heaven moves. It's mirroring heaven. It's what I know to do from the word of God, what's been told to me, what I've experienced in life. I begin to understand this is what God likes. He likes it when I moved. I'm not talking about works, the kind of thing unto salvation. Salvation is only through Jesus Christ and him alone, period. But after salvation, you begin to understand we are moving faith to faith, that this is a kinetic move. It is a movement. In fact, there, the, the Bible after the, the books of the Bible, book of the Bible after the Gospels is the acts of the apostles or what some would say the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles that when the Holy Spirit comes, when Jesus gets you born again, you believe and you receive, now you have access that comes to you through faith. In other words, heaven opens up as you move. You do things. You move in faith. Amen. Faith. You walk by faith. The just lives by faith. In fact, just look at that real quick. This is what I went into last week in Hebrews chapter 10. Let's look at verse 38. This appears over and over in the Bible. I think four times that I know of, maybe five. The just shall live by faith. Last week, I talked about Martin Luther and Gutenberg and how God raised up two men. By the way, I got part of that wrong. Uh, they, I thought that somehow in my study, I thought they were overlapping lives. Gutenberg was old. Actually, Gutenberg died and then Martha, Martin Luther was born, but they, they were relative contemporaries for that time. Gutenberg was a businessman that created the printing press in order to get the Bible in hands of people massively. Luther came along and because the, the populace had been massaged with the word of God, there was the opportunity for a reformation or a revolution, which Martin Luther took advantage of, transforming the church and making how we live now in Christ much easier than it was prior to that. But the mantra for that time, the saying for that time is the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. So in Hebrews chapter 10, it says this in verse 38, now the just shall live by faith. What is faith? It's forward leaning. It's having a substance, a knowledge, a sense, a feel, and moving upon that feel and seeing it actually realized, made visible. The invisible becomes visible because you step into it. That step into it energizes heaven and brings heaven down on earth. That's why Jesus said, what do you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What do you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What I do here has effect in heaven and what heaven does has an effect on earth. You see the little cycle there? <laughs> so we're gonna talk about that just briefly. In fact, Jesus, when the disciples said, how do we pray? He said, when you pray, say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And the second part of that, after worshiping and adoring the Lord, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He gets into an imperative. The feel, uh, Larry Lee, 25, 30 years ago, had probably the greatest uh, understanding of this, that, that it wasn't, you know, <laughs> It wasn't, it wasn't what we think. I mean, we've, there's a great song out there, you know, the Lord's Prayer, and it's very annoying and we love it, you know. But it's not, it's not, it doesn't feel the militancy, I think, that this part of the prayer felt. So, you know, we're like, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. Now, instead, the Greek speaks this way. Come thy kingdom, be done thy will on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, it's like pulling that stuff down. 
I'm pulling down solutions. I'm pulling down understanding. My actions, I get into a dilemma. I'm moving and say, I'm moving in faith. Your response as you begin to move, you know, even when you tithe, what we're just talking about, when you tithe and give, forget about the whole thing, is this tithing and is this required by God? It's been practiced for 6,000 years with God's people that 10% of our income comes, goes in. And the Lord says, when that happened, there's a release. In Old and New Testament. Old Testament is like the windows of heaven will open up. New Testament, they say, give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. You will not be able to contain what happens. It's reflected in the Old New Testament that as you give, it's an act of faith. It releases heaven stuff and the treasure of heaven begins to pour down. I, I kind of like that. It says this, the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back. Now, now when you're confronted with a situation, we have these colloquialism sayings, so forth, that that speak to this, you know, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to take a step back just to just observe the situation. But the Lord talks about a just people that move in faith. In other words, they're leaning forward all the time. Now, I get that we're not always like that all the time. We have bad days, bad hours, bad months, whatever. But there's something about the very character of these people and the ones that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11, which follows this. He says, look, I love it when you do that. I love it when you lean into me. I love it when you trust me. And when you do that, I will immediately reflect that from heaven and bring it down into your life. That's the walk of faith, the just shall live by faith. But it says here, but those who, who draw back, what? Wait, I need to think about this. But those who draw back, my soul has no pleasure in them. So faith brings pleasure. Drawing back, no pleasure. Now I get that there's gut punches. I've mentioned this before and it takes a minute to kind of catch your faith breath. <laughs> you know, you get back there then and you go, no, 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 yeah, okay. No, no, we're moving forward. We're moving ahead. And so you begin to move ahead and brings pleasure to God. But it says, and you know, several years ago, I think it was about five years ago, this became a real revelation to me in a, in a, in a different way. Look at me, read verse 49, 39 first. But we are not those who draw back. In other words, he's saying to the Hebrews, this isn't you. But we are those who believe, those that lean and move forward and step out in kinetic ways to the saving of the soul. So five years ago, I, I saw this word, uh, hypostasis, or however it's pronounced, Beth would know better. Hypostasis, the Greek word for it, about drawing back. And it came to me, I, I coined a word, the hypostolic. There's the apostolic and the hypostolic. Apostolic are those that lean in, hypostolic are those that draw back. And so you kind of have to decide, are you in the hypostolic or the apostolic? And I wasn't referring to this side as the hypostolic and that side as the apostolic <laughs> or vice versa. But the apostolic are those that are sent forth, forward leaning, faith believing, moving into the realms that are not so sure in the natural, it's still in the visible, but our walk is not by sight according to the word of God, but by faith. Faith. So in faith we move forward, and when you do that, heaven responds. God responds to faith. And so here's a, a quick overview. Shrinking people, hypostolic people, will not see what is going to happen. They will not be bold. They will not be generous. They will not lead. They will not see miracles. They will not bring pleasure to God, and they will see destruction. And I'm not talking about they're, they're going to go to heaven. You know, they're, they're in Christ Jesus. They're going to heaven. But it could be hell on earth. So those expanding faith people, the apostolic, they, they will hope and lead. They will see the unseen. In other words, they will see miracles. They will pour out of time of difficulty. In other words, when things are difficult, they're, they're going to continue to be moving forward. They will discover solutions. They will bring pleasure to God. And they will gain a testimony or what I like to say, bragging rights. I love bragging about God. Yeah. Michael and I encountered somebody uh, at a hotel the other day that was uh, working there and started chatting with her and, and immediately, you know, within a couple minutes, you can discern where somebody is and what they're going through. And, and uh, we got opportunities to brag about what God's doing because she says, yeah, the church is shrinking and, and, you know, people are stopped. They're not going to church much anymore. And we, we went on that. We, we, didn't, we didn't contest that or rebuke. I just said, well, our experience is the opposite. People are gathering together on Sunday, like this Sunday. We're packed out. People are hungry. People are under, they don't want religion, but they want relationship. 
They don't want some kind of facade. They want reality. But if there's authenticity and reality and honesty and integrity before a group, who would not want to be a part of that kind of a tribe? And so we're, we're an apostolic people. We're sending forth. We're reaching forward. We're believing for great things. Now, Jesus said the prayer on earth as it is in heaven. I also thought too of Jacob's ladder and, and that the, as I was mentioned earlier, and there was the, when he woke, when he woke up out of his dream, he, he said in the dream that the angels were ascending and descending. It's interesting because I always wonder why were they not descending and ascending, like heaven come down, going back up to heaven. But instead, it was something that was being initiated on earth that was ascending and then descending. It's a kingdom principle. What you do opens heaven up. Now, I gave many examples last week. I talked about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Michael and I had a little debate about it. It really wasn't a debate. We agree very much. But on our way up to Michigan on Wednesday, we had a little thing we were going to up there. And I asked Michael, I said, answer this question, answer this question for me. Did Jesus look like Mary? Michael, Michael's got a master of divinity. I figured he'd know. <laughs> and he did, actually. He kind of straightened out my thinking. But he said... Uh, he said, yeah, I, I think so, because, you know, we were talking about, we're in Genesis 3.15, it prophesies that, that human seed would basically be bruised, but would also crush the power of darkness. So it's this, it's this tension between the earthly and the heavenly, the temporal and the eternal, that God has chosen in his wisdom that we do things that will provoke heaven. It's that father and son business that we've got going there. And that he goes, son, I mean, sometimes he says, son, you want to do that? Let's do it. Other times he says, this is where I'm going and the son follows. So there's that, there's that sense as you walk through things, you're realizing if I need heaven's help, I must move in faith. I must lean forward. I will activate heaven and I'll please my father. Kind of quiet. It's true though. So we get human seed in Mary's womb overshadowed by the Holy Spirit that creates the deliverance for all mankind. You say, well, yeah, but Mary didn't choose that. No, she did. She did. You say, well, but God didn't choose her. I mean, how did God pick her? How did he select her? Was it a random selection of some sort? Was it like a lottery or something? You've won, you know. <laughs> Can you wait till I get married first? Uh, no, no, because the angel says, uh, hail, favored, one. So I mentioned this last week briefly, but there was something she did that caught the attention of heaven. I also spoke about Cornelius last week where something that Cornelius, who was not even a follower of Jesus, was a, uh, a Jew mimic. He was doing the things he saw the Jews doing, trying to be righteous, and somehow that rose before God and God used him as a gateway to all the Gentiles. So this, and I could go on and on. The things that were done, in fact, there's a huge list of this in scripture. Let me just give you a few so you know I'm not just uh, uh, grabbing from the air here. Uh, Mary, seed and favor, God's overshadowing. Cornelius, alms and prayer, God's open door. Noah's ark, God's gathering of animals. He could not gather all the animals around the world. Wine skin, wine. Water in pots, supernatural wine. Sword of Joshua, hailstones of heaven. Your soul, God's spirit. Your money, God's blessing. Now let me get a little deeper and practical here. I only have 10 minutes left. Medical care, supernatural. You know, I've been thinking about Dawn a lot lately because of her struggle with cancer, which is a very serious struggle. And we're going to pray for her at the end. Remind me to, to, to do that right at the end. But we're going to pray for her to get healed of this. But what I learned four years ago, and sometimes there's supernatural healing, sometimes there are supernatural miracles, sometimes there's healing that takes time. And sometimes God uses things that's in this realm that he decides to touch that literally, I believe in my mind, that when you put a Band-Aid on a wound, you're using medicine. You're using a medical procedure. You're understanding this wound needs to be protected in some way from infection. And so we do that. We never think about it. We go, well, that's the right thing to do. Like I said last Sunday, if you fall down and broke your leg, for people that go, oh, I just want to believe God, I'm not going to have anything to do with the medical community, and you know, they're, they're, they're just trying to get money, and all these little th arguments on the internet, why medical community is bad. Let me tell you something. The medical community 
are tools in the hand of God. Amen. And people that have given themselves to the medical community, I believe, are servants of the Lord. Is it perfect? No. It's better than it was 500 years ago. It's better than it was 100 years ago. It's better than it was 20 years ago. Because the medical community, by me we using that tool four years ago next month, four years ago next month, my life was spared. You said, oh, no, that was God. Of course it was God. God moving through the medical community. And so there's a sense that we understand that sometimes what we do in natural realms, I know this feels a little bit repetitive from last week, but I felt to double down on it this week, that, that this, the tools that we used in the natural realm do supernatural things because we do them in faith and they attract God. I mean, Elijah, when he left, his mantle it was a blankie. The blankie fell out of heaven. Elisha picked it up. He goes over to the River Jordan and he says, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Boom. Now, if he had just said that, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? It would have sounded like a complaint. But he took the mantle, struck it in the way Elijah would have, and boom, supernatural stuff happens. He walks into a whole new destiny as the protege of, of Elijah, now moving in the power and the spirit, actually biblically doing twice as many miracles as Elijah came forth in Elisha. Why? He's a man of faith. He goes into a community. The first one was Jericho, and they had bad water. So what did he do? He got salt. You remember this? Natural substance. Salt. Sprinkled it. It's a, it's a picture of faith. He's doing something tangible. Now he knows, I know a lot of people argue, well, maybe it just needed salt in the water. A little bit of salt, you know, would kind of make it better. No, we're talking about an entire city's system <laughs> was, was made clean, was, the Bible says was healed. The Spirit, why? Because he put... He put salt in there. Supernaturally, he moved. He did. This is so biblical. It is so New Testament. And so it makes me wonder when people go, we don't do chemotherapy. I had an aunt that did chemotherapy and it made her worse off than where she was. And chemotherapy is all bad. See, individuals who are struggling through something need to hear God for themselves. And our best response is to support them in their faith in God as they move in a natural realm. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe that God uses a doctor to set, the, set your leg that's been broken to make it heal? If nothing else, he gave the knowledge for that. I think the Lord, was, when I was in the hospital, the Lord, the Lord led me to so many people that were believers that just in a moment, I remember one of the big ones I share, of course, I was uh, 21 days, I was in the hospital and stem cell transplant. I went through a, a situation uh, well, a bunch of situations that, that were difficult. I mean, up and down, up and down, up and down. And when they finally took out this port that I had in my chest, I still have a huge dent in my chest from this, from this port that was massive. They called it a highway for the blood system, you know. And these things, just, these, these things just hung out of my chest. And when I went in there, of course, they have to pull this thing out. I thought, well, I'll be asleep. No, you'll be awake. And so they wheeled me down my 133 pound body into the basement of the Cleveland Clinic. And I'm down there all alone. My wife couldn't come with me. You know, it's just, it's this environment down there where they do these kinds of things. And uh, the lady was getting prepped and everything. And I looked around and in a moment, I mean, you know, don't have a hair on my head. I'm just, I'm, I'm emaciated. I'm down to a, a, a slim, 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 grade 10 weight, you know. And uh, I looked over and someone from our church works down in that department. I saw her. And I called out her name and she looked over at me and I, there was a second, I don't think she knew who I was because I was emaciated and broken. And, and she said, Pastor Steve. She came over, pulled the curtain and immediately started praying for me. I mean, I could tell you story after story after story. And so people go, wouldn't you have rather had a miracle? I said, I had a thousand of them. Lined one after another. Would you do it again? Absolutely. I had Randy Clark pray for me. John Arnott pray for me. Heidi Baker pray. I'm talking about in the flesh, touching me, praying for me. Bill Johnson, Paul Manwaring, 
I don't know who I'm missing, but just about anyone you would know that is well known for healing. And I just told the Lord, I said, Lord, I did my due diligence. I'm praying, I'm believing, but I'm hoping that the prayer that's holding before me is going to bring me through. And so when the medical people said, do you want to do this? I said, yes. I saw it as another path in God. And I said, their prayers, Paul Manwar and God bless him, they bought me a sweater, <laughs> anointed it with oil. The whole senior team out in Bethel Reading prayed over it, sent it to me. Not real, I mean, Paul just knows these things. He's a nurse, you know. But you're always feeling cold when you're going through these, these treatments, you know, particularly chemo, extreme chemo. You know, I was cold all the time. That sweater was on me a lot. You know, and it, was, it is a sweater that had been anointed and prayed for by my, my heroes in the faith, Bill Johnson, Chris Valentin, and others like that, and the oil that was there. And yeah, it was just a little symbol. When I put that thing on, though, I was talking to some people the other day. I entered a realm that I've never been in before. And it was, I told people somewhere between earth and heaven, I, I don't know where it was, but it was a place where I had no fear whatsoever. It was a place that, you know, I love my family, I love my wife, and I love everything about it, but I was willing to leave that. I was, I, was, I was reaching out into another place and I, it's hard to explain because even saying that sounds like I don't love them, but it was, my heart came into a place where I understood it was gonna be okay. I just found out the other day, I totally forgot, I forgot about this. Don Reichlin had a word over me about four years ago down in Akron. She came up to me, she'd had a dream or something and said, I saw you walking down a path to heaven. And I remembered after she told me, remind me of this, I remember what I was thinking. When people gave me those kinds of words, I thought, I'm, I'm dying. I'm dying. But then she said, you knocked on the door. Jesus opened the door and said, Steve, you need to go back. And so I liked that part of the dream. That was awesome. <laughs> and I was willing to go ahead. I felt I was a little too young. And you know, there's a lot of stuff that comes with cancer and any kind of serious uh, debilitating type disease like that. There's embarrassment that comes with it. There's inconvenience that comes with it. There's, particularly in the Christian community, you can feel like people say things to you well-meaning but are inferring that you brought this on yourself. If you have lung cancer, people immediately assume, well, did you smoke? They say that to people. I've heard them say those kinds of things. I'm like, that's not the way to minister to somebody in that situation. You always say the first phrase, you're, this is a little side tidbit of information, always say, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry you're going through this. Yeah. Whether, you, whether you, you have feeling, empathy, or whatever, it's the right thing to say. Yeah. Say, I'm sorry you're going through this. And then depending on the level of your relationship, you say, I am here for you. I will not leave you. Whatever you need, I'm there. Whatever finances you need, I'm here. I mean, the undergirding of the community and the koinonia, those that are together in a church, has huge power to it. You might say, I'll cook you a meal. I, I couldn't eat it. The best thing you can do for me is pray for me and send me encouragement. And of course, when I was in a hospital, I got tons of texts and Facebook. I mean, at the key times, I'd hear my phone go, vroom, vroom. I'd look at it and people were praying for me all over the world. It undergirded me in times when I'd get discouraged or just feel very weak or pain, painful or whatever. It, it came in. Like, what, what was it? What was that? It was about a series of natural things that people did in faith that were actually natural things that had at its core supernatural magnetism from heaven. So anyway, I've been meditating on these things and thinking about it. And Actually, this week I started studying 2 Corinthians and Thinking about the beholding of the, I'm going to go over just a few minutes because I got to I got to hit this one thing here. But beholding the Lord, it's like a mirror; it's a reflection. That when you look into heaven, you behold the Lord. And by the way, this we think of worship. It's not fully the context of it. Uh, it's really anything that you do in faith pulls open this this open channel between you and God. When you go to work with joy and with faith, there's something that it pleases God. When you enter into a difficult marital relationship that you're struggling with and say, you know what, we're struggling right now, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna start believing in faith and speaking things and doing things into this relationship. As soon as you start serving someone that is not serving you, Immediately when you do that, it's called laying down your life. When you lay, no greater love is, is in the Bible than that. When you lay down your life, you lay down your life. When that, is, when that happens in a very natural, practical way, boom, heaven touches it. It becomes supernatural. I mean, if you want to change your life, begin to stretch yourself in the realms that are counterintuitive to you on this side of heaven. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm not going to love my enemies. I'm just not going to do it. 
God just didn't seem to understand who my enemies were. <laughs> and so you serve them, you take them out to eat. You, and I'm not talking about some kind of codependence. I'm talking about an authentic saying, you know what? I'm going to love this person. Even though I don't feel it inside, I'm going to exercise something that's counterintuitive. And when you do, woo, heaven comes down. It says in 2 Corinthians that when you behold the Lord, you are transformed inside. When you behold the Lord like a mirror, you, Bill Johnson says that you become what you gaze at. I love that. If you're gazing at the wrong things, you're going to become that. Will you begin to gaze upon the Lord through your actions, through the stuff you do, through your faith walk? The just shall live by faith. You attract heaven. And the big part of that is once you do that, oh, there's so much in scripture. I wish I had more time here. But in Corinthians, it talks about this walk of faith that as you begin to draw from the Lord, it it becomes reflected to other people so much so that when Moses came off the mountain, they had to throw a veil over him. And in that passage in Corinthians, it says the veil has been removed. You behold the Lord. You become a man or woman of faith. You begin to stretch out. You become counterintuitive. You do the Jesus thing. You follow after Jesus. And I tell you, you're going to have more heaven than you can handle. So what happens? This week I was driving around. The Lord told me to go to a dollar store. That's what I got for a dollar. Actually, I got two of these for two dollars. And so I was thinking of it. If this is in heaven, I look at it. I'm being shaped and molded and conformed into the very image of Jesus Christ. But the cool thing is, you yourself become a reflection. So as I'm, oh, good, good lights here. Look at this. Oh, got some reflection there. You see it? This is the kingdom of heaven. This is you right here. Light from heaven coming into you. Going into every individual in this room. It's amazing. This light touches on people's faces. I know it's a little unpleasant right now as this thing's <laughs> shining in your face, but you can't help it. You're like Moses. You're reflectors of the glory of God. Why? I'm moving in faith. I'm opening heaven. I'm bringing the pleasure of God. It's going to touch and transform me. And as it does, the light is going to go out to all those that are around me. Right here, this, this man right here with the beard. Shake your, you see him? Yeah, stand up just for a minute. Now see, it. light came down. Light's reflecting out. This is a year that's going to be transformational for you. There's a whole new door opening up. In fact, you felt that there's been like some things closing up as if the Lord was like locking things down or something like that. I see like a storage bin or something, a storage shed or something like that where it was just put it out there. And the Lord says, it's because I'm setting that aside not to, end, not to end the things that you're hopeful for, but to bring a whole new menu in front of you. I feel the Lord's presenting a menu to, to you and he's saying, what would you like? And the Lord's actually, in many cases in the Bible, gives you the opportunity to begin to declare and speak your own destiny. It's not over. It's not too late. It's a new beginning right now. We bless over your life right now a new beginning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's do one more. <laughs> Let's see here. This is kind of fun, actually. If you're visiting, I feel sorry for you, but it's... Uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna pick out a visitor. I'm not gonna weird anyone out or anything. But uh, right here with the uh, yeah the uh, give shirt on right there. Yeah, that's you. Stand up for a minute. Yeah, this is a this is a recalibration of what God's been doing. You're you're almost feeling pulling, pulling, and it's a gentle pulling. And the Lord is wanting to pull you into a new place of expansion. There's something about where He's saying you're feeling actually pretty comfortable with where you are. And the Lord's saying, that's fine, I brought that to you, but right now I'm going to pull you. I feel like there's a pull to the right, I don't even know what that means, but typically it means something more conservative. There's a sense of you're, you're going to get something that's more uh, uh, wrapped up, packaged kind of a deal. It's, it's something that, and in it you're going to find heuristic creative abilities that are going to spring forth out of it. But I feel it's something that's going to be easier for you to do and it's going to produce more time for you to do the things you love to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like it's like it's almost algorithmic. You're 
I could do it with my eyes closed. But he's giving that to you as a safe haven so that you'll have time to creatively launch into some of the things that have been dreams that are continually feel like they're getting farther and further away. And so we speak to it right now. And give is on your shirt and it's not by accident. We bless it right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that your power will come down. This will be a time of full recalibration. And it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. We bless it right now. Lord, you chose him out of this room, obviously, because you wanted to speak this word. And I pray, Lord, that word, as he leans into that word, that heaven will partner with him. And that which would normally take 10 years will be like dog years, like a year and a half to two years, some 18-month, 24-month period, this thing is going to fully get running. It's getting its legs, it's starting to stand up, and it's going to walk, and eventually it's going to run. And it's going to run through your life and run through your destiny, and provision is going to follow after it, for goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And we bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's all stand together if we could. Whoa. Don, if you could come up, and Joel, we want to pray over... If Joel's here, yeah, Joel's here, yeah, come on up. If you could just face the crowd here. We want to, Don has been uh, kind of re-diagnosed this past year in 2016. Uh, uh, just a terrible uh, diagnosis. And uh, a couple weeks ago, she uh, resigned from her position here where she was a senior administrator uh, in order to give more time to focus on this, this battle with this disease. Her battle is our battle, right? And so I want you to stretch your hand toward her, and we're going to pray. And here's the deal. Don may, we don't know totally what Don's going to do. She's got choices she can make, things she can do. We're going to support her, just like we, she's a great person to practice hearing from God on in this situation because she's so visible in front of us, such a, an excellent, dear woman. That we, she's going to make choices. And some of them may be in a realm that are natural. Don't be tempted to say, well, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Instead say, I agree in faith with what you feel God is calling you to do. Whatever that might be, we bless it. We support it. We stand with it. And so, Lord, I stand with Dawn right now. We just speak right now. Our highest prayer, Lord, obviously, would be complete, instant healing into her, her physical body in the name of Jesus right down to a cellular level. Every rebel cell we rebuke in the name of Jesus. Every broken cell we rebuke in the name of Jesus. We speak healing to the very molecular core of her being in the name of Jesus. I speak strength. I rebuke this cough, Lord, that's been harassing her, Lord. We speak to her lungs and every part of her physical body from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet. We say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And Lord, whatever method she chooses, Lord, we stand with her and say, Lord, all the way, all the way, all the way, healing, healing, Lord, completely in her body. We thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Anyone else here suffering with real physical problems that are, that are either uh, continuous or uh, doctors say there's there's no hope for one of those two. Just kind of raise your hand around the room. I want while we're praying for this right now. Just this is your opportunity. If you're struggling with something, let's pray together. Someone near some nearby, just lay a gentle hand on their shoulder specifically. I feel it's the safest place to pray for somebody. Just lay a gentle hand on the shoulder. We just say you know, all around this room, we speak healing, Lord, from arthritis, from all kinds of diabetes, Lord, lung diseases blood diseases. We speak to it all right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, you know every heart. You know people that are doing their best, like the woman with the issue of blood who'd spent all of her money trying to get healed. Nothing worked. So she came to Jesus. And even then, Jesus didn't come to her. She went to him. She pressed through the crowd. And Jesus marveled at her faith. We speak right now to a people pressing through a crowd and saying, Jesus, I need healing. I need a touch from God. We ask, Lord, that you will meet them where they are. We thank you. And may they become a testimony. May they have the bragging rights of heaven on earth. And we thank you, Lord, that Don will have a story to tell. 
and the days ahead. And we bless that right now in Jesus' name. God bless you. If you're not a believer here today, you've never followed Jesus Christ, come up and see me afterwards. I'd be glad to lead you to the Lord Jesus Christ, to give you a Bible. Me or one of my team members will be glad to pray for you. The rest of you, we bless you and you're rising up, you're lying down, you're coming in, you're going forth. May the favor, grace, and mercy of God richly rest upon you every moment of every day of this week. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Next Sunday is very important. One of my most... <laughs> epic topics yet. We're going to talk about where we're going as the future, how that fits into this country, and where we are right now. Bring some friends, come out next week, and let's see what God has for us for the future.